Hi there, it's Marlet Narrate. In this week's message, Adam speaks about the nature of a church budget. Where does Narrate get its money? What value is there in supporting the local church? At the end of the podcast, we have included the question and answer time from the conclusion of each gathering as well. Enjoy as we learn more about the budget here at Narrate. Hey, good morning. It's officially football purgatory. How you doing? So uh, this morning is what we call a one-off morning, which means that this morning really we're just going to, it, it's just one-off, a one-off message, and I'll talk about why that is. Those of you who are nerdy note takers and you like the mind maps, I didn't give them to you this week for strategic reasons because there's certain stuff that we're going to talk about this morning that I just thought you might get up and leave if you saw that 20 minutes ago. So we're going to control <laughs> that and not give you that opportunity. Uh, next week, you're, uh, I have the chance to interview Vern. Vern was the lead pastor of the place that planted this place, and so I think that'll be a fun chance to hear from him and get to learn a little bit about who he is and therefore who, how we are. How, who, you, I'm not communicating well. Why we are who we are. Um, someone last service identified themselves as a professional speech person, like they teach it, and they told me, he told me that I was at 750 words per minute, and 751 is you can't listen to that, and so <laughs> try trying to slow it down. I said 149 is boring to listen to, though, so I'm going to air to the side of fast. So next weekend is Vernon, and then the next weekend we're going to start a brand new series, uh, a relationship series we're calling Relationship Charades. I think will be lots of fun. We're going to speak especially to marriage, but really to all relationships. This morning, the question that I want to ask uh, is, uh, where does Nary get its money? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, but, and, and I, I laugh, and I don't, I don't mean that flippantly, but I really do empathize with those of you who are guests, those of you who are your first time, or maybe your first few times, because I get this is terribly uncomfortable, and, it, and if we're not careful, it fulfills all the cliches as to why you wouldn't come to church. I also feel bad for those of you who brought guests, especially if you've been asking them for weeks or months or years, like, hey, would you come to church with me? And I know how those conversations go, like, no, this one's great, no, this one's great, no, this one's different, this one doesn't do that, and then here they are, right? asking for your money, and which is not what we're doing, but if we're not careful, it's what you're going to hear us doing, and so totally empathize with that. Uh, a couple things to say before we jump into it. First of all, uh, w- this isn't a budget shortfall. We're not in one. In fact, you'll see in just a little bit that the opposite is true, so this isn't a, about a, being a money grab or anything like that. You'll have to ultimately trust me, but, but the, statistically that, or from a facts dollar standpoint, that is very true. The other thing is that there's a person who's a church planner that I've had the chance to get to know uh, a lot, quite a bit lately. And we met a couple weeks ago, and candidly, he was kind of sharing some of their financial outlook, and what became clear to both of us was, uh, you're, you're going to probably, in all likelihood, if something doesn't change, the, the thing is going to fail financially, but no one's going to know it's failing until it's failed. And I realized when I was talking with him, and I, this is all stuff, conversation I've had to his face, that there is, in fact, something that's more dysfunctional than talking about money, and it's not talking about money. And I think that's true individually and personally. It's true when we're sending our kids off to college, and it's true as we try to be a community together. And so hoping you can trust me on this. The other thing about this morning is I think, in fact, ironically, it's actually a great time to be a guest at a church because in a very real sense, what we're going to do this morning is pull back the drapes a little bit and let you see into who we are and what we, how we function and, and really nothing marks what a person, an individual, a family, or an organization values more than what they do with their resource. And so I, I honestly think it's actually a really good weekend to shop us if that's what you're doing and figure out if this is in fact a place that you want to associate. The question I want to ask is where, where do we get our money? And what I'm getting at there is like where do we get the resource to rent this place? Because it's not free. Uh, we pay a rent. We would like to think that we pay a, 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 a fair market rent, though Grand Street is incredibly good to us. Where do we get the resource to rent this place? And in fact, uh, adding to that, last year as our fiscal year wrapped up, our fiscal year, by the way, is September through August, as we were finishing up our fiscal year, the council began to recognize like we had a little bit of extra. And frankly, we were talking about increasing our rent to these guys because Grant Street hasn't increased our rent for, for years. And in the meantime, they've done nothing but make improvements, especially to the bathroom. Some of you remember what those used to be like. They've done a phenomenal job with their bathrooms, the lobby downstairs. And so the council was like, let's increase our rent. And then there was this conversation of like, well, no, that'll be harder for them to manage because it'll just disappear. Let's just cut them a check. And so we cut them a $10,000 check last summer as a way of saying, hey, thank you. And by the way, whatever future facility stuff that you want to do, we would love to be the first 10,000 of that. But at the same time, there's no strings attached. You do with this whatever you want. If you want to buy lollipops for everybody in town, you go ahead and do that. Like no control over that. My point is simply this. Where do we get the resource to do that? Where do we get the resource to provide coffee to hundreds of people every Sunday, to have a staff of eight people, three full time, 
right now, but we all know, especially the spouses of part-time people, there's no such thing as a part-time job. Where do we get the resources to do that? Where do we get the resources to have a staff that, in my mind, exists to do all the organizing that the rest of us do for our other jobs during the week so that when we get together to scatter and, and to gather, we, we have a high level of excellence in organization? Where do we get the resources to, to pay for lunches and coffee so that the staff can network with you all and help you meet one another and point you to counselors and resources and all those different things? Where do we get the resources to host uh, middle school gatherings in 326 Fuller? Because we, we lease that place. And it allows us to have enough room for our kids on Sunday, enough room for middle school students, though that could be debated whether or not there's enough room uh, on Wednesdays, to host the band to rehearse on Thursdays, the Young Life on Mondays, and myriad other things, just random things from the community. Where do we get the resource to, to split firewood for Helena, to host a 19,999 egg Easter egg hunt on Mount Helena? <laughs> Hannah really thinks it should be 20,000, but some of us are advocating for 19,999. So you can weigh in uh, via an anonymous text to Hannah just telling her which one you think it should be. <laughs> where, where do we get the resource to do those types of things? And my only point here is to give you the information so that you can do with it whatever you want. So here's some numbers. Uh, last year's budget, or excuse me, this year's budget is $556,744 in case you're wondering if our business manager is type A. Because you could argue it should be $557,000. <laughs> that, that's Those aren't pennies, those are dollars. And in fact, here's a giving update, which hopefully will help you take a deep breath if you're already sick and you're like, really, a church, we're talking about money? How surprising. Here, here's where we're at. Your, our fiscal year again goes September through August, so September through December. So, so hopefully this buys me some credibility because realistically, the last thing that someone like me should be doing is saying to you, hey, we're $13,000 in the black because if we wanted to reinforce they don't need your money, that will do it. But here's simply my point. If you're somebody who, who responds to giving on, on kind of an emotional level, like if, if you're somebody who's like, I, I give when my heartstrings are pulled on and you've already kind of tightened down your wallet or you've reached into your wife's purse and took the checkbook because you know she's a sucker for those pitches halfway through a concert, good news, uh, you're safe. Because quite frankly, we pride ourselves on not being that. I don't even necessarily believe in that kind of giving. I don't think the Bible teaches that kind of spontaneous giving at all. If you're the type of person who really loves to give to the guy on the corner, but not the organization who works 365 to serve the guy on the corner, you're safe because we pride ourselves on being the organization who serves the guy in the corner in 365. What I want to ask is, where does it come from? And to get at it, we have to go all the way back to 2006, because back in 2006, uh, I, God and I started talking about this thing called planning a church in Helena. And I'm not sure who started the conversation, though I do know where I was, because back then, before I lived in Helena, Billings doesn't have trails, they have sidewalks, so my routine was to drink coffee and then go for a walk, not drink coffee and go for a run like I do here. And, and so one of the problems when you get up at 5.30 in the morning and then start drinking coffee and then go for a walk is you get halfway into your walk and you have to go to the bathroom, which if you're on Helena's trails, no problem whatsoever. But if you're in downtown <laughs> Billings, if you're in downtown Billings, that'll get you arrested. What I figured out, we lived downtown, was that there was a certain side door at St. Vincent's Hospital that wasn't locked at six o'clock in the morning. And if I snuck in there, there was a bathroom right inside the door and I could go to the bathroom. So I know where I was, though I don't necessarily uh, know who started the conversation. That led to a conversation with my wife, which led to a conversation with close friends, which led to a conversation uh, with Vern, my boss, which led to conversations with more leaders and more assessments. And eventually, uh, they all put us, uh, Teresa and I, on a plane for Orlando. It's a tough gig, but somebody had to do it. And we flew down to Orlando, Florida to go through what was called a church planner's boot camp, which is essentially where they look at you and go, congratulations, you have a vision. That's the easy part. How now do we translate that vision into things that you can actually do and make sure this thing actually works? Came home from that. And eventually my friend uh, Vern, my boss Vern, now I'm honored to say friend Vern, uh, he, he gave us the green light to start forming a launch team. Now a launch team w was, of course, people that say, we want to do this with you. We believe in the vision of this. And in our case, it was tricky because these weren't people who you're saying, hey, would you like to drive your car to this end of town this weekend instead of that end of town? These are people that you're saying, hey, would you like to sell your house and quit your job and move to Helena and start all over again? And, and so we got to start building and launching that way. I also got to continue building it by driving to Helena once, once a month and meet with people like the Kootenicks and just kind of have this conversation. And here was one of the tricks of the launch team thing. And at the time, this was so uncomfortable to me, but now eight and a half years later, it was the most logical thing ever. Part of the belief was, you know somebody's on your launch team when they start giving. The belief was, 
You can have lots of ideas and lots of people and lots of ambition and lots of vision. And if you have three bucks, it's not going to really help you very much. So the first, the answer to your question, where do we get our resource? The, the first answer is, answer is from our from our launch team. Sometime in that same year, my friend Vern, I keep calling him friend, which trivializes that he was also my boss, but I suppose he's both. Uh, he pulled myself, Kyle Ball, and a guy named Josh Reno into a conference room. Josh was a business guy that we were really wanting to move here with us, and but he didn't. But his loss, our gain, well, not our gain, but his loss, because he's missing out. So he didn't move with us, but he pulled us into this room, and Vern started doing the thing that, you know, people who have experience in something do. He started, and what he was doing was answering the question, like, how are we going to fund this thing? And it was one of those meetings where I, we said almost nothing, and he just kind of was talking out loud. He was going, okay, so you need a 16-month budget initially, because you want to have make sure you get to a September to August fiscal year, but you're not starting in September, so we got to do that. And you need to spend about $100,000 on portable church gear, and so, which is stuff we use every weekend. So, and he started, and, and ultimately he was like, okay, so for the first about 16 months, you're going to need $250,000. To which I was like, I think I'll go find a job. <laughs> and then he, just as a matter of fact, he was like, okay, but here's how we'll do this. Harvest will give you 100000 That's where I was working. The church he led, Journey will give you 100000 That's Bozeman uh, at the time. That was Brian at Journey. And, and $50,000 from these random churches, like places like Plentywood, $250,000. And then here's the deal. Uh, what happens is you have that money, and that really operate, allows you to operate above your pay grade, so to speak. Like you get to operate at a higher level than you really have resource. And the deal is that at the end of that, like, you've built enough momentum so that by the time you've burnt and spent all that 250K, you've got enough leaders in place and people who believe in the vision enough that the thing is self-sufficient, and if not, you're sunk and you go work at Wells Fargo. That was very much the idea. It was a sink or swim, one-time deal. So the second answer to your question is mother churches. And yet Vern left us with the commission in a way that only Vern could say it. You'll get to understand this more after next week. But part of what he said was, and don't return to the teat which was like, you, you don't get to come back asking for more. This is sink or swim. This is, this is it. Now, sometime in 2010, we became financially self-sufficient, which means our costs and our giving, they, they equaled one another out. Those were from our what we would might call our initial owners, those initial people who originally bought into the vision and going, yep, we want to be a part of this. So the third answer to the question, where did Nary get his money, is our initial owners. And in 2010... Uh, March of 2010, going back into the archives a bit, we had 53 giving units. Now, giving units is church speak for uh, families. Like, if, if I write a check this weekend and my wife writes one, writes one next weekend, we're still one giving unit. It's part of how churches understand uh, giving and where those things are coming from. We had 53 giving units. And where did it come from from them? Well, quite frankly, it came from several years of just developing their vision for God's kingdom and local church. In fact, uh, you know, I'm realizing more and more that if I had, if you made me choose like one little tiny section of scripture from the entire Bible, I, th I, think, I think the Catholics have got the whole emphasis on the Our Father thing pretty nailed. Listen to this. Uh, our Father in heaven, Jesus says, our God who's right here, hallowed be your name. Life is about you, not about us. And then this next part just to me blows my mind. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, we paint Jesus as this person who was filling rescue ships to get into some kind of inanimate place after they die, and it wasn't what Jesus was doing. Your kingdom come now. Jesus' vision was for a people who would fall in love with his principles and, and the truth of what he had accomplished via death and resurrection, and that they would have this vision for local church that puts their hand in the soil and begins to complement God's desire to restore all things. That's who these people were. They were people who understood what Paul said. Uh, Paul said uh, this must have been one of the most awkward moments of Timothy's leadership because Paul wrote Timothy this letter, and it was this very much this, like, here's how to lead letter. And at the very end, Timothy goes, okay, now, now that we're through all that, tell everybody who's not rich to leave the room. And then Timothy says this, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us for everything for our enjoyment. These are people who understood that by the nature of being in 21st century United States of America, you're among the rich. These are people who understood that wealth isn't threatening to God and it's not a sin, that God wants us to enjoy our stuff, but these are people who understood the value of investing in local kingdom expression. Verse 18, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Notice he doesn't say, tell them to get rid of everything. He invites them to adopt a generous perspective toward others in this way. 
They will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Notice what's going on there. This isn't this some kind of future thing. This is this you get to get started now in something that never ends. These are people who had a vision for local church. That's, I'm just trying to level with you there. These are people who, in my kind of back office vernacular for years, have said they, they, they had the vision of one bucket and one budget. That we don't do fundraisers and we don't do bake sales and we don't do designated giving and there's not like, here's a hundred bucks and I want it to go to the youth group. That, that what we say is we invite you to be generous and be a part of the vision of this place. And the council and the staff will work hard to set a budget and they'll manage resource. And that's the, that's the one inbox is the bucket. Online, you know, bill pay, you kind of go like, okay, it gets a little blurry, but it's the same idea. These are people who, who wanted to trust a bigger vision with their kingdom resource. These are people, I, I love the way Paul says it in First Thessalonians. A couple years ago, I re, or about a year ago, I realized that I've fallen out of habit of kind of studying the Bible word by word and verse by verse, so I challenged myself to spend some time in First Thessalonians. And uh, without that, I wouldn't have, I think, seen what happens in 1 Thessalonians 4. It says, Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. So you're some of you going like, cliche, cliche, love people. But then he says this, Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. And when you start peeling back the layers, Paul is speaking to the issue of money. And he's saying, listen, listen, you're called to love other people be more and more generous with your stuff to make local church happen in this area that they called Macedonia. Where does the money come from? It comes from people who have the vision for that. This last week I was talking to my friend Fred on the phone and he was asking me, he said, I'm so what do you teach? Do you teach the Old Testament tithe or do you teach New Testament giving? And I had this moment of like, I don't, I haven't even thought in those terms for such, like I think if I use those principles, people would look at me cross-eyed. I said, I think we're, I'd like to think we're just emphasizing self-giving love and generosity. And then he started talking. He's like, that reminds me of Matthew 6. And I was like, oh yeah, I could use that this weekend because that's like the best money passage in the entire Bible in my mind. In Matthew 6, Jesus says something that is so easily missed. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. You know what's going on there? It's an idiom. You know, like holy cow, those phrases that we use, deader than a doornail, which we don't use anymore. Like, what's a doornail? It's an idiom. And it's an idiom, a, a generous eye, or excuse me, a good eye, a healthy eye is a generous eye. That, that was the normal Jewish thinking of the, t- of the first century. A bad eye is a stingy eye. And some of you in, in life, in business, you, you already see this play itself out. But see, what Jesus is warning us is what we all know is that a, a life that is pre, is just has a bias for generosity that likes to live as though there's enough for, for more than just me, like that, that just changes the entire posture of a life in a family. And a life that says, how can I possibly share with anybody else or save anything for later because I don't have enough as it is, that, that is a dark hole that like any dark hole will take over the entirety of the thing's existence. So where does the money come from? It comes from people, probably you. It might be you. And if it's not you, then it's very likely that it's somebody sitting to your right or to your left. Because there's not a tree in the Beartooths, and there wasn't a property that we liquidated, and there's not a trust fund anywhere. It's, it's people who believe in the vision. In fact, just looking back at last year's budget year, 2016 to 2017, let me just, here, here's just data. Last year, there were 259 giving units. I've already explained what those are. And Doris, uh, because she should be running Microsoft but serves us, um, she, she could break it down even further. Watch this. So uh, she says 75% of the giving units uh, give ten to $2,000 annually or 20% of the total giving. Uh, 21% of the giving units give 2000 to 10000 annually or 48% of the total giving. And 4% of the giving units give 10000 plus annually or about a third of the giving. And to those of you who are part of that, perhaps my biggest motive this morning is to say thank you. Uh, Because we've unapologetically set out on a path that says we won't exist without vested owners, and you're that, so thanks. Now, there's this thing called imposter syndrome. We talk about it a lot because I think I struggle with it a lot. It's a function of being egotistical and insecure, which turns out go very well together, but it doesn't make for a very healthy emotional life. (laughs) Imposter syndrome is this thing where you live in this constant fear that you're about to be found out for not being as good as you are. 
I think as Christ followers, we're even more susceptible to it than the normal population because we align ourselves with the most beautiful, profound life ever, ever lived and we dare call ourselves followers of him, which is why one of my friends says, I prefer not to say I follow Jesus. I prefer to say I try to follow Jesus. And especially if you live in a house or work in an office where you're surrounded by skeptics, you, you get the, 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 the sense of like, am I the real deal? It's everywhere. You know, I realized this last week, and, and again, like, you, you, could, you, you have to interpret my motives in saying all of this, but I did realize this last week, that I think, and, and this is a conversation I catch myself having with new staff more and more frequently, I think one of the best things I've ever done to guard myself against imposter syndrome, honestly, has been developing that giving muscle from a very early place. That when there are struggles and when there are doubts and when there is intellectual uh, questions, Something about the fact that, that, no, I know, I know that I'm vested that way. It helps me. I remember when I was 19 years old, sitting in the back row of Faith Chapel, which is where I had the opportunity to, to meet Jesus. I, I remember the first time I wrote a $100 check and put it in the basket. And I remember thinking, those are a lot of zeros. Someone's going to call me this week. <laughs> Nobody called. <laughs> Probably because Stan doesn't look, and I don't look either, by the way. You should know that. I, I, I don't look. But my point is this, I remember how it changed the level of ownership I felt towards that place. And I don't know about you, I go through life and I often wonder, while sitting on a chairlift and it's come to a sudden stop, am I a real man or am I just a little boy? <laughs> like, do I really have what it takes? And for me, quite honestly, and, and I, just for what it's worth, the fact that I know that I have, I'm a man on this issue, to be honest with you, it is one of the major like strongholds I have to my faith. And my fear would be that for some of us, we, we, we think that the conversation about money is, a, is a, about a, a Jesus who wants to get our money. He talks about money more than anything else in the New Testament. Mm. And yet he also seems to have this insight that says, listen, I, I don't want your money. I want the entirety of your life. And yet story after story after story shows us that, that where your money is, so, so go your, your values. I'm telling you, when you're financially vested in something, the coffee's better, the music's better, sermons maybe, <laughs> but you just, it, it changes things. You know, when I, back in 2010, I, I realized that uh, like many of us, I, I, I had entitlement issues. And it was a very healthy thing. Like I would say back when we started, the thing I had the least amount of vision for was what I'm doing here this morning, and that was talk about giving. And I will now say genuinely eight and a half years later that one of the things that excites me the most is to talk about giving, and here's why. What I realized was that we existed as a church. That $250,000 came from like little old ladies, so to speak, in Plentywood, Montana, who so believed in the vision of local church that they collectively gave us 250 grand to make one happen here. One they would never attend, one that they weren't necessarily connected to in any way, but that's how much they believed in it. And I had this realization of, wait a minute, we exist because those people developed a vision for giving somewhere else, and now we get to benefit from it. We get to benefit. And then I realized when we started to break even financially, like, wait a minute, I don't like to talk about giving. I almost never talk about giving. But the honest reality was, and we talked about this at the time, we, we made it that far because people who had developed a giving muscle somewhere else were exercising it for our benefit here. And there was this moment of like, wait a minute. So I'm more than glad to take advantage of the giving that other people have learned and grown. But I myself am too big of a coward to to grow it myself. And it's actually kind of a freeing thing because to be honest with you, I give very little thought to whether or not Narrate will exist in 50 years. As, as much as I'm a planner and a futurist kind of thinker, I, I think almost nothing about that. But here, here's what does excite me and does literally uh, give me goosebumps. I think that if we do our jobs on this issue, whether or not Narrate exists in 50 years is a moot point. 
that we have the opportunity to raise up within ourselves, within our own kids, within our own grandkids, this high value in local church and making it happen. We have the opportunity to learn ourselves to be the kinds of people who show up in a community and kind of look with a periscope over the scene and go, where is God's Holy Spirit at work? And I want to be a part of that. And quite frankly, I want to be among the financial givers, not the takers of that. And on that level... That excites me because the degree to which we and other good churches in town are developing that vision in ourselves and our kids and our grandkids, then guess what? In 50 years, Helena will be just fine with or without narrate because I've I've been on the receiving end of people like yourselves who developed that somewhere else and showed up here and we've got to use it to serve people. And the thought that in the next couple years, decades, even more, that we would get to pay it forward? That, that our kids, that our grandkids, that, that we ourselves would, would show up in towns not Helena, states not even Montana, countries not even the United States, and not just believe in Jesus, but go, listen, I understand that, that real, like great kingdom work requires people who who are willing to both serve and give, and where, where are they? Like that, that, to me, is a thrilling opportunity. So let me bottom line you, because this is going to sound a little bit weird, and it's really not my intention, because mostly my intention is to say yes, but for those of you who are genuinely like, I, I, I would love to do this, I just, it's so hard for me to find an on-ramp to this whole giving thing. There's this thing, and we've modified it to our own culture, because a lot of it got a little weird to me, but there's this thing that we're, we're calling the 90-day giving challenge, and here's the deal, this is going to sound just like 1-800-BIG-HAIR, so you can just <laughs> totally throw it out if you want. But if you're the type of person who responds to the type of tangible feedback uh, that sometimes is required to start a new discipline. Here's the deal. is Out at the scattering table, uh, there, there's a handful of self-addressed stamped envelopes with a piece of paper in them. And the advantage of that self-addressed stamped envelope is it's completely anonymous. The only person that knows that you'll do this is Doris. And if you want to sign that and fill that thing out, bank accounts, social security number, all that stuff, <laughs> totally kidding. <laughs> if you want to fill that thing out, then here's the deal. You want to start giving... If 90 days from the day you kind of sign that thing and send it in, you go like, I think I was duped. I think you manipulated me. We'll, we'll give it all back. Like, she'll, she'll write you a check and give it all back. Because as you can see, this isn't driven this morning by the sense of like, we're going to go broke. It's driven by this community of people who go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Th- this giving thing is is vital, it's essential, and it's a blast, and we get to collectively own what we do because we're vested. So if you want to be a part of that, it's there. And for the rest of you who are vested financially, thank you. And for those of you who are a little grossed out, we'd love for you to give us another chance next week. Let me pray. God, thanks, Lord, for... um, God, I'm just perpetually grateful that you're not a God who skips over the hard stuff and money is at the very top of that list. God, I pray that you would rescue some of us um, from our sense of scarcity and greed. And for the people, God, who genuinely, uh, they're they're grasping for handles as to how to grow in their faith and their relationship with you, that, that you'd lead them through this conversation. Thanks, God, for our vested owners and the myriad things that you're doing in and through them. Uh, We love you. Amen. So come on up here, Troy. We've got ooh, we've got an extra minute this time. I wow. somehow my words per minute must have went to seven fifty two. I got a really easy. We got a softball one to start off for you. Really? How's your salary determined? Oh wow, that is a, oh, that's a softball one. <laughs> Are we off? I don't know. Did we die? Did I turn it? I probably subconsciously turned it off at amen. <laughs> Am uh, I on? Sorry. So, I am. sorry about that. My, the, the council sets my salary. So okay. that um, they set the entire budget. When it's time to set my salary, I walk outside and kick the dirt and eventually get an email from them telling me what decision they've made. And they're always uh, far more gracious to me than what I expected. When uh, you talked about coming here, talking with people in Helena, how did you determine who you were talking to and sort of the order, and how, how did that process go? Uh, it was 
pretty, a pretty inexact science. I mostly hung out in 406 and just handed people flyers. <laughs> Not literally, but I did hang out there a lot. Like Randy and Lori would be an example. Their, their daughter, Kristen, was a part of Harvest, and so she came up to me one day picking my kids up from preschool and were like, here's my parents' card. They want to talk. And so it was a very inexact thing. And to be sure, the bulk of those conversations really didn't uh, kick off until we started doing those. We did those preview services last Sunday in June, last Sunday in July, last Sunday in August, and the design of those was to give people a taste of what we were going to try to be, and that's where most of those conversations really started to happen. Uh, talking about council meetings, are those open for owners to attend? Wow, now there's a question I've never heard. That's a new one. Um, it would, I would have to, hmm, no. <laughs> <laughs> But if someone really felt strongly, they, I would certainly welcome that conversation. I mean, it's not that we have secret handshakes. It's just part of what makes council functional. Um, frankly, um, part of what makes it really functional is it, it becomes a safe room um, where I don't, have to, I, don't, I don't have to say everything just right the first time. And so that would be the detrimental side of having outsiders in is it would, it would change the outlook of, of our ability to do that. I suppose on the uh, sort of along the same lines of saying the right thing and talking with people about money. How do you navigate the conversation with people who maybe don't agree with with how that money is spent on projects? It says uh, I eat ales, and then parenthetical, I like ales, by the way. So, um, <laughs> so there's a twofold conversation there. One is that's the whole one inbox, um, one budget is we're asking people to trust and, l and recognizing that not everyone's going to agree with us, and they're. In, in that case, I would say then go find a church that you trust. I, I always hope there's a conversation. Ailes, though, would be an exception because Ailes is one where, because of the controversial nature of the association with alcohol, the council, before we ever started that thing, made this strategic decision that, that we weren't going to use tithe dollars for that event. Um, and so that's almost entirely true, minus w we do one. So, you know, Ailes happens because of sponsorships. And so... We spend $1,000 a year on ales on, in the form of a sponsorship. That's the only tithe dollars on ales. I don't know if I answered the question. I got specific. Right. I think it's all right. Okay. Um, about this building, are, are there and what are the plans if we run out of space here? It's a constant conversation space, which, I mean, we've already run out of space if we're being honest, right? Like, if, if you wanted to talk conventional church wisdom, by the nature of not moving out of this space three years ago, we've put a cap. Uh, we've, we've negatively impacted our growth. Um, and that's not something that we're flipping about. It, the, the way we say it is, but we're not going we're, we're to scale. We're, we're not going to sabotage culture in the name of scaling. So it's not that we're closed to being somewhere else. It's that we're closed to being somewhere else for the sake of being somewhere bigger. It would have to, it would, and, and part of that is we want to be in public space where we can serve in Grand Street. Any, anytime you're talking, coming alongside a church, it requires a person who's willing to take a risk because, I mean, we're not the most popular thing in town. And Grand Street has, is so generous to us that, that it, would, it would take a pretty perfect scenario to leave it just because we have such a, a really special partnership. Do we have a savings account, and does that savings account gain wow. interest? It is so fascinating. So I'm looking at Brian back there who's on the council. So we, um, every service this question's been asked, yes. which is crazy. And it's affirming to me because we as a council have made, we've wrestled with whether or not to talk publicly about one of the decisions we made several years ago, which was um, several years ago, we, we made this decision that we wanted to run our finances the way we think healthy families and businesses run theirs, which is to say that there should be an emergency savings account. And so several years ago, the, the decision the council made was that we were going to start at 3%, and essentially what that means is we were going to start at 3% and start saving 3% on top of the, um, the upfront money that we received from other churches, which I think we burned that down to about 100 grand. Um, we were going to start saving what you might call retained earnings or just saving in the name of future emergencies. So a projector gets dropped. Um, we don't want to have to lay somebody off. We want to have the resource for that. Grand Street, um, I, I hate the thought of it, Grand Street burns to the ground. Suddenly we're like, what are we going to do? We wanted to have cash for that. And so what they decided was that that year they would start at 3% and that we would go up 1.5% every year until we 
get to 10%. And we're right now at 8.5%. So for every $100 given, $8.50 goes into an emergency savings account. And candidly, I don't know the exact number, but that number is right around 200 grand right now that in the event of an emergency could be leveraged for things like that, which cuts one of two ways. It either looks like hoarding or it looks like fiscal responsibility. And so the fact that you guys are asking it, we were just, I was just talking to someone between services, like it, it affirms that hopefully that you share that value. Cause I don't think you'd ask that question if you were skeptical of it, but right. maybe not. You mentioned um, Brian, who, who is on the council? Yes, yeah, right, I mean, the doing council. So the council, um, Kyle Ball and, and Jim Darling, they, they were there from the very beginning. Uh, we've since added Steve Schroeder, Daryl Stordahl and Brian Anderson. So there's six of us, including myself. And how is that council chosen? Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Subjectively by me, uh, along with a lot of conversation, I kind of have as a general rule in my head that I'm not going to put anybody on the council who hasn't been here for a couple years um, because that council sees themselves as a council, not a vision-creating mechanism. Um, they they want to provide counsel fiscally and uh, with decisions. And so just we, we make sure that we have enough time um, to know that they're a good fit. And we're at this weird place now where I, I look around all the time and I see lots and lots of people who would um, qualify for that. And what some churches do is they time their counsel out every two years or every four years. And at this point, I just haven't made the decision to do that. Just, again, like it might be selfish, but it, it's one of the safest places in my life and I'm not willing to disturb that right now. And the other question I'm just going to jump on because it's a good question. Someone asked me the first service why there aren't women on it. And the answer to that question has nothing to do with a belief about gender and leadership. Um, that, that's not why there's not a woman. She's like, good, that's all I needed to know. Um, but f for me, quite frankly, there, there will be someday. Um, I haven't been able to get my brain around thus far just being candid. Well, you get to decide whether it's candid. Um, I haven't been able to get my brain around thus far, excuse me, who that person is that allows it to continue to be this candid, safe place for me. And we, we will eventually, but that, we that's We just got two <laughs> questions on that. So you're And the you're other thing I'd point out is we've, we've got a staff of, of eight and seven of them are women. So it's not a belief in female leadership at all. It, it's, it's just, frankly, the way things have worked out and the other things I said. Can you, uh, a couple more here, um, can you explain how you choose how much money goes to what portion of the church? Like rent, mission trip, salaries, you know, yeah. how's that divvied up? So every May to early June, Doris, who's our business manager, who's on staff, she sends out emails to the entire staff asking for their budget requests. And it's really a twofold ask. It's asking, wh what do you need to do what you did again next year. And so think of someone like Hannah, when, when our average weekend attendance goes up 50, just providing coffee takes more resource than it did the year before. And then the second part of that is, um, what, what do you, what are the new, what's your visionary desires? And so those requests all come in and, and Doris sorts those and puts them together. And simultaneously, she's working with the council to use projections to determine what's gonna be the giving for the ensuing year. And then generally what we have is we have this projected giving number and this projected expense number, and generally the requests are $100,000, $150,000 more than the projected giving, and thus begins this unenviable task of working with the staff. And the first thing we do is we get us all in a room and we go, okay, guys, we gotta, we got to start cutting money. And we, last year we had to, didn't have to do that to that extent because it wasn't as severe. And we just collectively work through, like, what, what are our priorities? Um, so it, it, it's it's to in large part, a, a group decision. Probably our, our last question, I suppose. I know we didn't get to all of them. But um, what is your, I, you, you kind of touched on it. You've talked about vision. You've talked about um, the future when you are talking earlier. But what's your final vision for Narrate? Where, where do you see your retirement day? Where, where do you see the church? Man, I, I, I'm, I don't know. I, my prayer has always been that we would be a church that grows by 5 to 10% for several decades, um, and I guess if I have the opportunity to make the decision to step away in some capacity, uh, it would sure be awesome if there was some leader that we could pass a baton to, um, but I, I hold, that's what I mean, I, I hold that loosely. I think that the Holy Spirit will show up in 
and move um, those that he's connected to, and it'd be an honor if we were that for the foreseeable future. And yet I hope that the moment in which we're not that, we have the courage to see it and get behind the one that's there. So would would love for Neri to have a legacy, but I'm not going to define my 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 day to day around that. Um, it, well, I guess first starting off, um, not so much a, a, a question, but just I, you pointed out you don't know how much people are giving, right? Right. The, the the council doesn't know, the board doesn't know. So this isn't a, you're not looking at people knowing yeah. what job they're working in and going I, eh. So I, I think that's a safe thing and probably sure. something worth pointing out. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't look. I mean, we have to functionally. Somebody has to, and she has a blog. But I mean, other than right. I'm, just, I'm just, just kidding. Yeah, no, I don't. But know. you have to have a subscription to get into the blog, and right? So it's which, which in a lot of leadership, a, a lot of I've had lots of guys tell me I should know, and I'm just like I, I'm not spiritual enough to handle that information. <laughs> do you uh, do you see Nary being a mother church in the future? Uh, I'm sure we're sure open to it. It's something that. Um, the council's had conversation about. I don't, I don't see us actively trying to go after it or being close to it. Yeah. You, we we talked um, about generosity and and sort of relying on that. And a uh, question here says, generosity is great and wonderful, but how do we know what we give is enough for God without that percentage, without that mm-hmm. portion? Yeah, I mean the. How do we, so the question is, do we lose something when we lose the 10%? Yeah, I, I suppose, or how do, you know, you're, you're sitting there at home trying to figure out what do I give. Right. There's not somebody leading me in that direction. How do I know I'm yeah. giving what's needed? Well, I think Paul, the way Paul talks, seems to talk about giving in to the Corinthians is planned percentage proportionate giving, uh, which means it's not a spontaneous thing, which means God's not impressed by amounts. He's impressed by percentages. I don't know if impressed is even the right word to be using there. And that proportion proportionally means that as my standard of living goes up, um, so does my standard of gen- generosity. I have friends whose goal is to to be giving forty or fifty percent um, by the time they hit their fifties and sixties because of that. So ten percent is very helpful because it, I think, s- provides a floor. Um, I definitely wouldn't want it to be a, a ceiling, but I also think that if a person starts at three percent, that that that'll take care of itself, I, I think. Is there? Do we have savings? Do we put money aside as a church in case there is a budget shortfall? Man. Seriously, you're not manipulating that. Yeah, that's it's, two it's services right in a row. I know. Okay, so we we got that last time too. That's interesting that you guys want to know that, and that's affirming. So the council made a decision a few years ago that we've, with trepidation, um, we've wondered how to talk about this, but I guess today's the day. Um, <coughs> Several years ago, we had this conversation that was, um, we want to run Narrate's finances the way we think healthy families run theirs, uh, which means that we should, we should have a plan for emergencies. If the projector gets knocked off the thing and broken, we shouldn't have to lay somebody off. We should have the resource for that. Um, if, the, if the Grand Street burns to the ground, we, should, we don't have land to leverage anything against. We, we, we should have the opportunity to have some kind of um, cash strength. And most churches are cash poor. So the decision that they made was starting in that year, I think it was at 3%, that they were going to start taking 3% of every dollar given and put it into an emergency savings account. And the plan has been, and we've continued to execute, and it's been kind of cool actually to watch God work through all this, that, that we would go up a percentage and a half until we got to 10%, meaning that we would arrive at the place where 10% of every dollar given is going into an account that's trying to get to that three to six month emergency and would give us the opportunity to, to cover emergencies. I think, Doris, are we at seven or eight and a half now? We're at eight and a half now. So I, I don't know that exact figure, um, but it's, it's somewhere around 200 grand right now is, is sitting in that emergency fund, which cuts both ways, right? That, that could reinforce that you're the rich organization, you don't need our resource, and we're just going to be candid and go, you, you, we all get to be adults and decide whether that makes us good stewards or hoarders. So during that process of building up, you know, that emergency fund, has there been a point since that, that what, March 2010 <coughs> moment that finances have been a little bit strained and you've been going, what are we going to do this month, this quarter? Um, n- only to the degree that I'm German and the council is fiscally conservative. <laughs> so I, I think 
we, we've seen a, a strong trend of generosity. What messes with me when, is when we're like, hey, we need to go make another hire. So that's going to, that's another family who's really trusting that we can make their salary or whatever it is. That's where it gets uncomfortable for me. But no, we haven't, we haven't had to lay anybody off or do any of those things. You talked, um, before you talked about the fact that, that we rent, that we don't have a building, we uh-huh. don't have land. What are the, what are the benefits, what are the pitfalls of, of that situation? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I, I love that we literally don't exist without a high level of ownership from people. Uh, because Grand Street had a show last night, which means we had a lot of work to do this morning starting at about 5.15 if we're even going to be here. I love the gauge that Portable Church provides of are people vested? Are you excited about this? Um, because stick around here long enough and we're going to put you to work. Um, that, that, and, and I love that you're not inviting your friend to a church. You're like, they couldn't possibly butcher chickens on the stage because they meet in a public venue. So I, I think it... <laughs> I think it just makes everybody more safe. Just have a good cleanup crew. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> which, which, which we do. But yeah. is, is there a point do you see, you know, continuing on that? Is there talk about do we own a building in the future? I hope. I hope not. Um, the disadvantage is we've already we've already had our lack of space has already had a negative impact on our potential to grow. Like, let's just be honest. Um, you guys are maybe the greatest example of that. Like, you know, that there aren't very many seats and lots of people don't like to be as tight as you are or go to church at 1130. That's the disadvantage. We're constantly paying attention to plan B options that exist out there. And that hasn't been a very fruitful endeavor over the last six or seven years. But I I can say that the council in particular is very engaged in, in going okay, what, what other potentials might there be? And we've pursued some of those, and so far I, we just, nothing's worked out. And, and, and the Grand Street staff is so good to us. So, Sort of uh, on that same vein, you know, because of that or through that, narrates a little different, right, than, than many churches. Mm-hmm. Was that something that was planned from the start? Like at that boot camp phase where you're saying, we want to be this, we want to be a little different? Or is that more just sort of organically, that's how it happened? Yeah, well, the thing that boot camp really pulled out of Teresa and I is what is your affinity group? Like, based upon who I am, that is going to attract certain people and repel certain people. And because I wasn't raised in evangelicalism, and I don't, I don't really like church, I think that that's where this came out of. And what I mean by that is that the church Christian subculture doesn't appeal much to me. And if this was about how effective can I be at following Jesus along with my close friends, uh, we, we wouldn't be here. Uh, to me, this is about making Jesus accessible to people who are weirded out by us, which by church definition requires that we ourselves be weird because the more comfortable we are with our Christian culture, the more weird we are to our outside culture. So we have to do things like host beer festivals in order to say like, we're, we're, we're actually fairly normal and we care about a lot of the same things. I think probably a couple more. Sure. Time for a couple more. Um, when it comes time to make a decision about you know, having that beer festival, putting the eggs up on Mount Helena, how, do, how does that process go as far as money is concerned? What, what is the process? Who's involved? Setting the budget, those types of things. Yeah. So Doris kicks out emails to the staff sometime in late May early June that basically solicits from the staff, what are your budget requests? And it's really a two-fold process of what do you need to do what you did last year, and then what's the vision that requires that you need more? Simultaneously, Doris is working uh, with the council in forecasting based upon, you know, now we have more and more trends, what is, our, what is gonna be our operating budget for next year? And then the council is bringing those two things together along with the, the staff to a high degree and going, Okay, our requests are a hundred thousand more than our than our projected spending. So how do we get inside of those specifics? And so the council is setting those budget numbers uh, again to make sure. 
uh, one of the things that's been, again, to make sure that we have a balanced budget, and one of the things that's been totally shocking to me since I've been here is the number of churches that I've talked to, and I don't mean to throw them under the bus, who don't have budgets. It's astounding to me. Like, so you just spend money? Yeah, we just, so we, we err to the other side. Like, we have a plan for everything, and most of them we don't need. We, uh, we've been talking money, a little uncomfortable right yeah. so so we'll end it with uh one that just came in this is a brand new question are you open to using sports teams other than the broncos as examples <laughs> i do it all the time i use the cardinals <laughs> uh, fair enough fair enough i think i am i just don't know that god likes any of the other ones <laughs> um when it comes time to make a decision about spending money, for example, the youth trip to Missoula, what steps are taken? What's that process look like? Uh, the biggest part of that, so in, I think this is the answer. In early June, Doris kicks out a thing to all the staff going, okay, we need your budget requests. And she asked for those requests in three forms. What does it take for you to do what you did last year? We call that our basic budget. And then, okay, so what new vision is it going to take? Uh, what, what visionary money do you need? Doris takes all that. This used to be Kyle and I doing all this, and, and we took a lot of volunteer time from him, and it was exhausting. But So Doris takes all those numbers, and usually they come back about $150,000 more than we have. Simultaneously, what she's doing uh, is working with the council, who's looking at giving projections, and kind of they're, they're deciding upon what's going to be next year's giving projection. And so then we've got to marry those two things, and then we have these hard conversations about cuts to make and all of that. And so once we then launch that budget, which technically would be September 1st, uh, that, that decision's been made where staff has already, they've already asked for that resource to go do that. Um, and the other thing we always say to staff is we want you to bat and manage your bottom line. So if you've got $10,000 to budget for middle school students, uh, if you decide that, okay, you don't want to do this middle school retreat, but instead you want to go to this camp, we're, we're just trusting them to do that. When you say we, is that the staff? Is that the... The council, a, a combination of both? Yes, yeah. I mean, the council, the, really one of their first tasks I is the finances. So they're super involved in the summer months when we're setting the next budget. They're reviewing stuff every month in terms of what our spending is. And then I'm individually working with staff on making sure that we're hitting our budgets. When you, when you think back on the days of that brand new church, of, of moving here to Helena, what does it feel like now, sort of seeing how far it's come since then and ultimately really how successful it's been? Uh, that's kind. Um, it, I, hmm, that's a really good question. I've always been more afraid of year 10 than year 1. Because right? who wants to go coach the Patriots? <laughs> right? like this, you, you, by definition, are worse. right? And so it's, it, what's, for me, the goal has always been, God, we want to be a growing church for the entirety of our time together. And I've watched so many churches do this. That's always been what's terrifying to me. Um, and so it's, it's, it's weighty because everybody wants to be a part of this new and upcoming thing and yet staying, um, being willing to continue to take risks as you get older is I think the harder part. I don't know if that's answering that question. I but think so. Yeah. Does it, in that same vein, is it because you don't talk about money often, and there's right. a trust there with the ownership, with sort of the process. Mm -hmm. Does that become frightening sometimes, knowing obviously that money's a necessity, you need it right. to come in? The, the most frightening thing is, again, like, supporting a church plan is fun, because you have tangible feedback. If I don't put this check in this bucket, this thing doesn't happen. The danger of putting a number up there that says we're $10,000 in the black is it reinforces that idea of that guy in the corner needs my money more than the narrate does so that that that's the that's the trick is trying to be honest with with people with you all and going th this is what it is i'm not i'm not going to couch it i'm not going to manipulate it but narrate will only be as good as we have in invested people you you talk about you know the the guy on the corner right and and, and giving in here mm -hmm. a couple of i guess related um questions there's you know speaking on ownership can you be an owner at narrate if you aren't putting money in that bucket, and then you know, how do you feel about people that are giving their time rather sure. than money? Can you be an owner without putting money in that bucket? Yes. I mean, I'm I'm not here to manipulate any of that. I just want those people to understand that 
those, there's, a false, there's a potential for a false dichotomy there because to assume that some people give money and don't give time and some give time and don't give money, those, those are both true. But there's a third category that's a pretty significant one, which are people who give a, a very generous percentage and a lot of time. And beyond that, I'm, I'm just trusting people to be adults and have their own relationship with God and make those decisions. I, the point at which I have to start weighing in heavy on those decisions, and we've become another religious institution that I just frankly don't care to be a part of. I'm just trusting that as long as God wants us here, people will work through those conversations in a way that everybody wins. So then does narrate sort of shy away from, from that traditional 10% off the top giving and just trust that, as you say, you know, they're going to be adults and, and, and give what they feel they yeah. need to give? I mean, I, I, I think 10% is practical more than it is biblical. I, I'm not really interested in that. Like, I mean, if you want to call it a tithe, we're talking about like 24.5% or something. T- to me, 10% is a very practical place to start. But we've talked in the past, like I... I like that idea of planned percentage proportionate giving. And so there's lots of people. By the way, I don't, I don't know who gives what. Uh, I don't look. That's part of the dynamic here. But I have friendships, and I, I, I know that um, 10% for a lot, a lot of people is far more a floor than it is a ceiling. How many of the original, you, you spoke about that, that launch team and the mm-hmm. people that first moved here, how many of those people are still here in the church? I'd bore you if I th- I'd have to count it through in my head, the Tom Rupp clan. Um, <laughs> that's half the church, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Kyle, Kyle Ball, I'm going to offend somebody now because I'm going to leave somebody out. So uh, my wife, <laughs> I think it's a good sign she still comes. Right. <laughs> Might say more about her than me, but, th- but there's a fair. I mean, there there are still people. That yeah, there, there's a few here. that have moved back. There's a few that have become really important parts of other churches in town, and I think that's great. Um, and there's a lot that are still here. Yeah, I mean, there were about thirty, including kids that came originally, so and about another seventy that were here after our summer previews that are, and a high percentage of those are still here. Right. It. In conventional church plant world, it's very, very common. In fact, at boot camp, they would say two years later, your entire launch team will be gone uh, because they'll be so overworked and they won't like the pastor anymore. <laughs> Just, so we've done better than most. Yeah, that's, that speaks to success, right? And speaks to so. something that there's that many. Yeah. We're, we're above that percentage. Or well, there's only one Grand Street Theater in town, either one. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah it's been a pretty awesome crew. You, you talked about the council. Who, who makes up that council? Uh, so the council right now is um, Jim Darling, Kyle Ball. I'm trying to think of who, who's been there from the beginning. Those guys were there at the very beginning. <coughs> Steve Schroeder, Daryl Stordahl, Brian Anderson. Am I, did I miss somebody, Kyle? Okay. Kyle was really hoping to speak this morning. Do you want to get him up here? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. There's, so there's six of us. Okay. Um, maybe, well, we can maybe fit two yeah, here. Yeah. D- does narrate budget for future shortfalls, or is it is this like a zero-sum game? Like, we, we're where we need to be oh, man. each year. Should I just go there? So the council several years ago made a decision that we wanted to run our finances the way we suggest. Um, this, this may not help our cause. Well, we don't have a cause, so I'll just be honest. The council made a decision several years ago that we, we wanted to run our finances the way we think healthy families run theirs. And so they made a decision then that they wanted to start saving uh, a percentage of all giving for future emergencies. So what they did is they started at 3%, and they've increased that 1.5% and are intending to do so until we get to 10%. Um, Because we don't own land, um, because we don't have anything to leverage anything against, and because most churches are are cash poor, they went like, no, we want to have emergency reserves working towards having a six-month emergency fund. Um, and I, I don't know exactly what that number is right now. I know it, it hovers around $200,000 right now that, that is, is resource that we could use in an emergency. A projector breaks, we don't have to fire somebody, we've got that money. So it, it's, it's controversial um, because you're, what you're essentially doing is saving giving then, but, and we've always called those retained, w- retained earnings, whatever you want to call those, um, that factors into the budget for us. It's a, it's a line item in the budget every month. I th- is it? Is it 7% right now, 8.5%? I can't remember, honestly. goes off to a savings account. 
So last uh, last question, so we don't push too far over. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's sort of r relating to that, and not necessarily an emergency, but does narrate budget for uh, like that man on the corner. It, are mm -hmm. there instances like that, moments when God sort of pulls at someone, pulls at the church and says, hey, this is somewhere where yep. we think we need to go? Yeah, we helped. There's a gal here who worked with a student who died of leukemia earlier, and we she's reached out to it. We have a benevolence fund for those account for, for those types of situations where we cut four or five hundred dollar checks, thousand dollar checks, whatever, for people who in those instances. Those are the hardest ones because they almost always come anonymously from people not a part of narrate. And the more you say yes to those, the more of those you get. It's a really difficult thing to manage. When I was on staff at Harvest, uh, we had over $20,000 a month in benevolence requests. So it's really hard as a church to manage. How, how much resource do we leverage for those anonymous needs? So we try to keep them to uh, relationships um, connected here. But So we've just given it a percentage. We've given it a budget amount. I don't know if we've given it a percentage. We've given it a budget amount, and we've just went, we have a budget to manage. So when someone emails in, we're working with one right now, and says, hey, can we help this particular person? And we go, where are we at with that budget? And yeah. Well, thanks for, yeah. Thanks I, for I know it's an uncomfortable uh, uh, conversation. And sure. Uh, I appreciate, I think everybody appreciates the openness and the willingness. So yeah, thanks. Appreciate that. Yeah. We won't thanks. keep you anymore. I think we're all out of time. So thanks for coming. Thank you Have guys. Have a good morning. Have a great week. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online, www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.